This is Joel Barton. I wanted to give you some optional physics background uh, to contextualize what's going on in your nuclear chemistry work. If you wanted to know what's going on behind the scenes of your nuclear chemistry work, this may help you. Otherwise, you can skip it if you just want to get right to the stuff. That's fine with me, man. But here's what we're up to in this slideshow is four fundamental forces or interactions uh, that physicists uh, have identified, and we'll rank them by their relevance for our chemistry work. And then we'll look at how a nucleus can keep itself stable or not uh, based on some of these forces. And then I want to wrap up by looking at uh, what's called a mass defect and help explain uh, some of the not quite whole numbers you may have seen in uh, numbers of AMUs recently. And uh, we'll give you some further resources to look at as well. So let's talk about four fundamental forces or interactions uh, that physicists have theorized are behind or could explain or could describe all interactions that are physical. Uh, it's gravity, electromagnetism, strong nuclear force, and weak nuclear force. And uh, these last two are sometimes just called the strong interaction and the weak interaction. So if you hear me say that, I'm talking about these last two. Okay, so let's get into gravity and ask how relevant is it to chemistry? Uh, spoiler, not that relevant. Um, it's relatively weak compared to some of the other, other interactions you're about to see. However, it does work at arbitrarily long distances. It works at theoretically infinite distance, and it always attracts thing, uh, things. It never repels them. Uh, so that's nice. And that's why you see it work on astronomical scales, is because it operates at very long distances. It always attracts things together. And so you get to see it clump stuff together at these astronomical scales. However, at very, very small scales, it's going to be overshadowed uh, by some of these other interactions you're about to see, like the electromagnetic interaction or electromagnetic force. Uh, it is strong compared to gravity as long as you're dealing with charged particles. However, because uh, charged particles could be either positively or negatively charged, you might have attractions or repulsions resulting from electromagnetic force. And so you're not really gonna see it on the large scales, on the astronomical scales as much, because if you get a lot of material together, often it's close to electrically neutral because you add up all of its positive charges, all of its negative charges, and then and it won't really affect much, you know, a light year away from it if, <laughs> if it only has, you know, just a teeny tiny amount of charge overage uh, on it. So you really, though, see it on these smaller scales, atomic scales, interparticle scales, uh, where you have just straight up, here's a few positive charges right next to a few negative charges. Oh, man, they're going to interact uh, in a very noticeable way. And really, that's most of chemistry. So most of... Uh, uh, interactions within uh, an atom in its nucleus and its electrons. That's what we're talking about is electromagnetism or between two atoms that are bonding. That's electromagnetism that we're talking about. Or uh, in some cases, right, it may be between two polar molecules and some of it has partial charge on one side. Some of it has partial charge on the other side. And that too is electromagnetism that we're talking about. Highly relevant for most of what we do in chemistry most of the time. So put a pin in this one. This one's really relevant. Now, strong nuclear force is especially relevant uh, for this lesson because it's exactly what it sounds like. It's strong. It's nuclear. It's a force. And here's how strong we're talking about. We're talking about tens of thousands of newtons, and we're talking about attraction when things are really, really close to, to each other, like in a, an atomic nucleus, okay? Uh, the femtometers here, that's one times 10 to the negative 15th power meters. Things have to be really, really close to each other in order to feel this attraction. That would be low on the graph here means attractive force. Um, however, if you try to get those particles much, much closer to each other than that, the force actually turns repulsive. So it's, it's based on distance. It's not based on charge or anything like that. It's based on how close are the two objects to each other. You can get them this close and they're really attracted to each other. If you try to get them any closer, they end up repelling each other uh, past a certain point. Whereas over here, as soon as you separate them away from each other past about 2.5 femtometers, they don't even feel it anymore. There's no attraction, no repulsion whatsoever. So it's this funny little force that's very, very strong, but only over this very short range. OK, um, which is why it becomes really important for nuclear chemistry, as you're going to see here soon. It comes into conflict uh, with the electromagnetic force, and that's going to help explain nuclear stability. We'll get there here in a few moments. OK, so there's one other force. Uh, we've covered three out of four. This is the last one, the fourth one. Uh, weak nuclear force 
is what it sounds like. It's uh, most relevant in a nucleus, and it's considered relatively weak, especially because it only acts over a very, very small distance. So if femtometers was the uh, the range for strong nuclear force, this is much smaller than even that. Its range is only over a single nucleon. Really, it's only a percentage of a single nucleon uh, is its range. It's extremely short range, very weak. However, that doesn't mean it's unimportant because it's the only force out of these four. It's the only one that's best described not as attracting particles to each other or repelling particles from each other. Instead, it's best described as changing the flavor of sub parts of these particles. Okay, stay with me on this. We're actually going to interpret this diagram together. This is probably the first and last time you'll need to interpret a diagram like this, unless you'd like to specialize in this in the future. But uh, we're going to go from the bottom of the diagram toward the top, and we're going to explain a certain kind of radioactive decay. All right, this is a neutron depicted down here with three little quarks in it. They're called little subparticles of a neutron. And as it moves forward, we're going to turn it into a proton. We're going to turn its quarks uh, this one is going to change from a down quark into an up quark. And this is what's unique about the weak force is that it's the only kind of force that can do anything resembling this, turning a little quark from one kind into another here. When it does so, what it's going to release is this little W boson, as it's called, which will then further break down into, uh, this is an electron right here. You'll call that a beta decay, a beta electron right here. As well as, if I recall correctly, and you can at me about this if I get it wrong, that is an anti-neutrino that's uh, being released from that, okay? But just follow me one time more on this diagram. You take a neutron, and it will actually turn into a proton. That's what's unique and kind of magical about the weak force, is that it's able to change one kind of particle completely into another kind of particle by changing the quark uh, that is a subpart of it. Okay. And so it's really, really relevant for nuclei because these are nucleons that we're changing in between here. All right. And so that's going to be really, really important for certain kinds of radioactive decay, beta particles getting released, as well as if I recall, and you can, you can check me on this, um, electron capture also in, is governed by this weak force. Okay. So that's the four fundamental interactions. Well, how do some of them explain nuclear stability? Here's how, uh, at least for a couple of these. Consider protons are all positively charged in a nucleus kind of depicted here. This is just a model, all right? Uh, if you're going to be more rigorous, do quantum mechanics, but this is an okay approximation. Protons are all positively charged. They're all pushing away from each other due to electromagnetism. Okay, but what's holding them with each other then? Ah, it's the nuclear strong force or the strong nuclear force. As long as everything is really close to each other, all the protons as well as all the neutrons, as long as they are really, really, really close to each other, they will stick due to the strong nuclear force, the strong interaction. And so it's only when you have particularly large nuclei or nuclei that have too many protons and not enough neutrons to them, that's when they will start to fall apart. That is when they will start to fizz apart, fission apart, and, and split apart. And so this nuclear stability can be really well explained as this, uh, this kind of conflict or fight between these two forces of electromagnetism and strong nuclear force, all right? And that's how you get uh, a diagram like this one. I believe you'll see in another slideshow and you'll see in the text, um, pictures like this one where it's comparing proton count along this axis here to neutron count along this axis here. And there's sort of a pattern of stability where the bigger and bigger you get with your atomic nuclei, the higher and higher uh, proton count you go, you need more and more neutrons in order to counterbalance that so that there's enough nuclear strong force without that much uh, electromagnetic force to, to push everything apart. So it's a really, really good predictor for whether that particular isotope of your sample is going to radioactively decay or not. Uh, and there's a little note here that, yes, yeah, Z is for protons uh, and N is for neutrons in a graph like this one. So one last thing, okay, and I'm not going to over explain this, but I'm going to give you the start of an answer to it. So for mass numbers, those are whole numbers, just the whole number of the number of nucleons that are present in your nucleus. Those don't necessarily match the mass in AMU for a given isotope. Why not? Well, you may have gotten a hint already that neutrons are different than protons, they might actually mass slightly different than protons as well. And they do. Here's your hint from earlier. A neutron can emit something to become a proton, 
I think it stands to reason the neutron might have more to it than the proton does, you see? So that's that's one little hint, is that uh, neutrons mass slightly heavier than protons do. Another thing is this, um, the strong nuclear force is so strong that you have to take into account uh, the theory of relativity when you're dealing with it. And it holds together a nucleus so tightly uh, that to separate out the nucleus again, the constituent parts of a nucleus mass differently than the total mass of the nucleus. I'll have to say that again more slowly with more gravitas. If I were to take four separate hydrogens, four protons, free existing protons, and put them together in a chain, a little chain reaction like this one. This is called the proton-proton chain in uh, stars and fusion process of a star to make a helium nucleus. It turns out that the mass that you start with is actually more than the mass that you end with. You lose mass in doing a, a nuclear fusion process like this one. It goes away seemingly it becomes the binding energy difference of the nucleus. The mass can be converted into energy and vice versa. That difference is accounted for by the famous equation E equals MC, e equals MC squared. If you've never heard it before, this is an actual uh, application of E equals MC squared, is that the mass difference or mass defect uh, is explained as the binding energy of that nucleus. Okay, if you'd like to know more, I have it in the further resources on the next slide. Let me just remind you that uh, there are these four fundamental forces. Electromagnetism is the one that overwhelmingly we're going to be referring to for most of a chemistry course. However, uh, for nuclear chemistry, you would want to know about a couple of the other ones. Uh, nuclear stability is a kind of compromise between that electromagnetic repulsion between protons and the strong nuclear force uh, attraction that exists between protons and other protons, as well as between the neutrons present in that nucleus. Finally, here the weak nuclear force is describing how some atoms are going to radioactively decay according to uh, the quarks changing uh, within their nucleons. It can emit beta particles, it can also govern uh, electron capture. And then finally, this mass defects thing is accounted for with theory of general relativity. You can look up more on that in this uh, nuclear binding energy article that I've got here. Uh, and uh, it's also mentioned in this uh, fundamental interactions thing. If I recall correctly, you can poke around in there. And this one right here is really fun. It's a live chart of nuclei. So it's a chart that is like this one, but you, everything on it is clickable. So you can see all the clicks for all the different isotopes of every element that we have data on, and it'll even tell you which uh, decays they're likely to do. So is it more likely to decay by alpha radiation or by beta decay, et cetera, et cetera. It'll tell you on this live chart. So have fun with that. I hope you find this background information useful before you do your nuclear chemistry. Enjoy.